are, <laughs> yeah, we are uh, currently raising two middle school kids, which is a totally new rhythm for us. Like we are learning in every age and every stage, and our kids have not to this day figured out that my wife and I have no idea what we're doing in parenting. Uh, One of the things that we're learning is some of the phrases and language that they use. I'm not talking about our kids swearing, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about like words that they use, words uh, that you and I use just in a much different way. Our kids, uh, maybe you've got teenagers, our kids use this word slay. When you and I say slay, we're talking about slaughtering something, usually in animal or something like that. When our kids say slay, when teenagers use this phrase, they're talking about uh, some sort of action or some sort of something that we are actively slaying in, like uh, six shoes, dad. You're really slaying with that, whatever that means. When, When we use the word or the phrase drip, We're typically talking about ice cream that is actively dripping down that we don't want to miss out on the opportunity to lap it up uh, in a hot summer day like today is going to be. When our kids use drip, they're talking about someone's aesthetic, someone's vibe. That person, I like their aesthetic. They've They've got drip. In the South, where I'm from, we have phrases that we use, a phrase like, boy, I tell you what. And that's it. Like, if you're not from the South, you're like, okay, I'm waiting. What are you going to tell me? That's the end of the phrase. And this phrase can be applied to any situation at any time. Have you tried out the new Italian restaurant? Boy, tell you what. That's it. (laughs) There are phrases, there are cultures, there are contexts where phrases and words and different people and different ages and demographics use different phrases in different ways. And that's kind of what Jesus is doing in the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, when, when we approach the Sermon on the Mount, when it comes to reading and hearing and understanding this sermon, we don't want to just assume that because we can read English that we've got this understanding of the Sermon on the Mount. Like we can, we can lock it down. We know what Jesus is talking about, which... We kind of do, but we need to drill down and dig deep into this context and into this culture of this message, this most important message from Jesus, which is why we preach and teach in the way that we do. We're not up here just giving you some cute alliterations. We don't want to give you four ways to a better you so that you can live a hashtag blessed life in this life. No, we want... We want to understand and unpack scripture in its context, understanding the culture all around it so that we can understand what Jesus is actually talking about, so that we can understand the original intended message that Jesus has, ensuring that we're not subtracting or adding or diluting anything from the message of Jesus himself. So as we approach a text like this, we've got to remember that the words that we're reading in our English Bibles, I don't even care if it's the King James Version, these words that we're reading in the English don't always mean the same thing in the original language of Scripture. Sometimes, there, honestly, there's not even a great English one-to-one option for the original word in Scripture because Scripture was written by Middle Easterns in a Middle Eastern culture. And so first century hearers and listeners to Jesus would have had this understanding and they would have captured some meaning from the words of Jesus that we may miss in our first glance. And so we are, we are officially a month in in this series that we're walking verse by verse, word by word through the most famous sermon that Jesus ever gave. The most famous sermon in in all history, in any religion, is what we're spending all summer long in. And as we're walking through this, we've already seen that Jesus has shown us what life in the kingdom looks like. He has identified by laying a foundation for us what our identity is in Christ as we live out our life here on earth, that we're salt and, and light. And now Jesus is going to talk about rules and he's going to talk about law, but I want us to talk about it within this cultural, contextualized 
understanding of what Jesus is talking about. So if you've got your Bibles with you, turn over to Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start in verse 17, and Jesus says this, Don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I haven't come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Now, when we hear the word abolish, our mind automatically goes to putting an end to something. We think about abolishing slavery, how slavery was abolished in the United States. And, and yet, when someone's hearing this as a first century, listening to this carpenter from Nazareth talk about abolishing the law and the prophets, they would have understood that Jesus was essentially saying, I haven't come to put an end to the law. I haven't come here to tell you that, that this law has been wrong the entire time. I'm not even here to tell you to just disregard the law. Now that I'm here, everything has changed. I love how Eugene Peterson writes it in the message. He says, don't suppose for a minute that I've come to demolish the scriptures, either God's law or prophets. I'm not here to demolish, but to complete. I'm going to put it all together, pull it all together in a vast panorama. Jesus is essentially saying to these first century hearers, I'm going to rightly interpret the scriptures for you now, which was actually the function of a rabbi. This is what a rabbi would do to interpret the Torah and the Hebrew scriptures for people. But this is essentially like me stepping up to you saying, today, I'm not going to teach heresy. I'm just going to teach the full and unaltered gospel of Jesus. And you'd be like, yeah, that's why we're here. So why would Jesus open this segment, open this particular moment of the Sermon on the Mount by saying this? I'm going to teach, and I'm here not to shut everything down from the law. Why would Jesus do that? There's all of the teachers of the law. There's all of the religious leaders who are in the crowd. It would be essentially like you or I stepping up and teaching a class on the Constitution to the Supreme Court justices. Maybe Jesus opens with this because he knows what's already being said about him. See, all throughout Jesus' ministry, the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders, the teachers of the law hurled all kinds of accusations about Jesus. This guy's blasphemous. Uh, this guy is demon possessed. This guy's breaking the Sabbath. He's trying to destroy the temple. And so Jesus, as he's setting the stage, as he's opening this segment talking about the law and rules, is about to unpack a brand new kingdom ethic, this new way, this new Jesus way that he says accurately. With everything that you've already been taught, he's going to uphold and teach that accurately. He goes on, verse 18. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until it's accomplished. Jesus is in this moment referring back to the actual Hebrew letters. If you look at the Hebrew alphabet, there's an actual dot and iota. There's a jot and tittle in the Hebrew alphabet. And so Jesus in this moment is drilling down underneath the surface, getting down to the depths of detail, even in the minutia, even in the fine details, we dot every I and cross every T. And what Jesus is doing here is reminding all of these listeners, all of these settlers who've gathered on the hillside in the, in the region of Galilee, Jesus is telling us that every word, every phrase, every idea, every single thing in this book, down to the smallest detail, is true and authoritative and will stand the test of time. And everything in here ought to be followed. But, but how's that possible, Brandon? We don't, we don't sacrifice animals anymore. We don't have a temple. And so is the Old Testament just obsolete? No, it's not obsolete at all. And that's what Jesus is affirming in this moment to all of these listeners. But let me answer that question. The reason that we don't sacrifice animals anymore, the reason we don't have a veil anymore separating us from the, the holiness of God, the reason that we don't have 
uh, Levitical law still in our life is because all of these things were meant to be a foreshadowing of what would be accomplished in Jesus' life and his ministry. This was all a foreshadowing pointing to the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And here, Jesus validates and upholds all of the scriptures that have come before. Then he goes on, verse 19, Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And so Jesus is starting to kind of delineate two separate categories. If you, if you water down at least one of these things, then this is an issue. But what Jesus is addressing is a very common first century problem where the religious leaders would start to delineate a distinction between the lighter commands and the weightier commands. The rabbis of that day would actually say, listen, if you don't tithe, it's actually not as bad as murdering someone. So there are uh, there are lesser evils in the minds of rabbis in that day. And so Jesus is taking this a step further, upholding the commitment to all of the commands of Scripture, which means Jesus doesn't leave room for us to discard the things that we dislike about the truth of the Word. He doesn't leave room for us to be devoted to the, to the certain parts of Scripture that we love. It's not a pick and choose where our devotion will lie. Jesus says that obedience to Scripture and all of the commands of God, down to the iota, and the dot is held up as, as an example of what is great. So let's Dr. Phil this. How's that working out for you? Is your life so shaped by Jesus? Is, is your life so shaped by Jesus' life? Is your life so shaped by the truth of Scripture that when someone looks at you, they may not have read the word, but they can see the word at work in your life. When you break it down to the, to the finest details, is Jesus there? Or do you have some selective devotion? Can I be honest? Uh, there, I have found that, that I'm devoted, really devoted to Jesus when everything is working out my way. When everything's going the way that I want it, it is so easy for me to be fully devoted to Jesus. But then there are certain moments in my life when things are hard. There are certain parts of Scripture, certain commands, certain truths of Scripture that make me uncomfortable that then lead to me being highly selective in my obedience. Like, whoa, Jesus, hang on now. You're asking me to forgive someone. Did you know what they did to me? Oh, Jesus, hang on. You, you probably wouldn't apply that truth to this situation of my life because this was hard. But here's the concerning part. You or I today, in an instant, can find on YouTube, we can find a social media influencer, we can listen to a podcast that justifies whatever mindset we want to have. Like, whew, I guess I don't have to follow that. Thing that Jesus said. But that is not what Jesus is talking about. It's not following Jesus down to the every dot and iota. But listen, the Bible can be comforting, especially in times of grief and pain and loss. But the Bible can also be very confronting at different places. When we take God's word seriously, when we begin to align our life with the, the words of Scripture and the truth of the Bible, then it can be very confronting because the reality is Scripture is not just here to butter your biscuits. Scripture is not just here to, to tickle our ears and to, to encourage and lift us up and give us things to have a little religious rabbit's foot that we can hang on to in difficult times. No, Scripture at times, when, it's, when it comes to conforming us into the image of Jesus, can be very confronting. Yes, it can be comforting, but Scripture is also very confronting. Uh, last week, I was with Gary and Kim in Panama, 
And uh, one of the things uh, about going to Panama, about going to a mission trip, is it, it confronts very quickly your comfort. And can I just be honest with you? I, I like to be comfortable. And Panama is so hot. Y'all, we don't have categories for the humidity that they have in Panama, but it is thick. I'm talking like the heat level is the same as your grandparents' living room on Christmas Day. It is so stink. Y'all laugh because like we don't, like we don't really turn up the heat in California like they do in Tennessee. I've been at my grandparents' house on Christmas Day. It is in the single digits Fahrenheit outside. Cold. And they've got it in triple digits in the living room. I don't understand how they do it. But this is Panama. It is hot. It's humid. Not everywhere is air conditioned. There's no hot water coming out of the uh, out of the showers. There's no espresso machine in Jesus' name. I'm telling you, it's uncomfortable. I like to be comfortable. Uh, my wife and I, we sleep on a king-size mattress made of memory foam. It doesn't even have springs in it like the traditional mattress. It has memory foam springs in it. In our home, we have central air and heat. I like to be comfortable. Uh, there are there's this thing that we have called Amazon Prime that I can order something now and in two hours it'll show up on my doorstep. Listen, y'all, if you can't find it on Amazon, you do not need it. I like to be comfortable in my life. But do you know what the Sermon on the Mount confronts for me the most? It confronts my comfort. Because Jesus says, every dot and iota which means for me, there is no room for relaxing any of what Jesus says. There's no room for me to decide what I want to follow and what I don't want to follow. If we're going to make any decisions, we got to decide if we're going to take Jesus at his word or if we're going to keep doing our own thing. I'm telling you, I warned you before, the Sermon on the Mount is not for the faint of heart. It confronts our comfort it confronts our selective devotion to God. It confronts our consumer Christianity. Because everywhere, we're, everywhere we turn, we are offered a comfortable consumer Christianity that prioritizes our comfort and avoids any discomfort. Carrie Newhoff, a pastor from Canada, says it this way, I'm convinced that the Christian subculture that many followers of Jesus are caught up in is a form of Christianity, but not the real deal. Most of what passes as North American Christianity is basically self-directed. Our unstated but very apparent goal after conversion is to feed ourselves, protect our families, live in a bubble, and get to heaven. Doesn't quite sound like the Christianity of Scripture. I'm so convicted by Jesus' words here in this part of the Sermon on the Mount about relaxing commandments. Did you know that we can actually, you and I, can arrange our life to the point that it costs us almost nothing to follow Jesus? We don't ever have to be uncomfortable. Rarely do we have to be in a position that we sacrifice anything in our life or choose to die to myself rather than coddle myself to become small so that Jesus can become great. We get so comfortable in our version of American Christianity that we miss out on Jesus' version of biblical Christianity. And that, my friends, is a problem. But Jesus goes on to say something that would have absolutely baffled the listeners. In verse 20, Jesus says, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Like this is the record scratch moment for Jesus. Everybody likely would have been dialed in at this point to what Jesus was saying. There would have probably been some soft amens. There may have been a little bit of golf clapping going on up to this point until Jesus says this. And then it's like, wait, what? There would have likely been murmuring all among the crowds because the scribes and Pharisees were the literal perfection of religious devotion in that day. 
They were the ones who meticulously kept down to the dot and iota all 613 of the Old Testament laws. In fact, they gloried in their piety and their adherence to the law. And then Jesus just goes in and drops a bomb. Unless your life, unless your righteousness, unless your goodness exceeds the greatest of all time, then it's not happening for you. I mean, this would have been baffling. It would have been so confusing to all of them. Unless, this is, this is a modern example, unless your basketball game exceeds the greatest of all time, Michael Jordan, I know some of y'all were bringing some LeBron James up in here this morning, but I'm here to tell you the gospel truth is Michael Jordan's the greatest of all time. Unless your basketball game exceeds and is better than Michael Jordan, there's no space for you in this. But what Jesus is doing here, he's not just setting this unachievable, never possible standard. No, Jesus is making a distinction, a delineation in this moment, because the religious elite, uh, they were outwardly compliant. They did religion better than anyone else in the day. But what we talked about a couple of weeks ago is Jesus doesn't just stay surface level. Okay, Jesus isn't just looking at the ocean from uh, the back patio. No, he's, he's deep diving. He's, he's doing this scuba adventure down into the depths of what's really going on under the surface, down to the heart and the motive that's underneath it all. It's this modern equivalent of grace versus truth. Andy Stanley, a pastor in Atlanta, says it this way. Truth without grace creates hypocrites. But all grace without truth creates a permissive version of faith that hurts everybody in the end. But grace and truth as personified and illustrated by Jesus, is so powerful. Jesus, in the gospel, has given us both grace and truth. Not one more than the other, but both perfectly and completely ours in Christ. Jesus, in this moment, is drilling down to get to the heart of the matter because the fact is this. Jesus is more interested in our heart because our heart can lure us into this consumer Christianity. And because Jesus drills down into the heart of the matter, we're a little bit uncomfortable. Uh, Peter takes it a step further in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10, as he's writing to this church, as they're navigating, these believers are navigating, what does life look like in lieu of the gospel? Because of what Jesus has done, what now ought to we do? That sentence didn't make sense, but verse 10 As each has received a gift, this gift of the gospel, this gift of Jesus, as each of us has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Peter is saying that we've gotten this gift from Jesus, and this gift ought to make us, Jesus ought to make us, following Christ ought to make us the most generous and serving and in giving. Translation, we have got to move as followers of Jesus. We have got to move from being just being consumers of the church to being contributors. But we're so wired to be consumers, aren't we? That if something annoys you about a message that you hear at a church, if like service times don't quite fit into the, to the brunch or the travel sports, Come on, y'all. I'm preaching now. Uh-oh. If, if, if programs aren't to your liking in a church, if, if something doesn't align with your opinions and preferences in the, in the church, then we have the luxury in South Orange County with all of these amazing churches all around us that it is so easy for us to just be a consumer of the church that if we don't like something about the church, we can just pop over to another church. Y'all, there's four just on this street. I can hit a nine iron to the next great church. Some of y'all, it would take like a six iron or a five iron. I I got a great golf swing, but we can just leave. We don't have to dig in. We don't have to stay. If I don't like something about one church, I can just leave. 
the reality is there, there are so many right here in this church who you call Mountain View Church your home, but you haven't moved in and you haven't unpacked anything. You got no pictures on the wall. You're treating a, a church family more like a hotel room than a home. You know the difference between a hotel and a house? At a hotel, everybody serves you. At home, everybody does their own part. And I'm not, I'm not talking to everybody in the room right now. I, I can look around this room and there are so many of you who are, you're sitting here in this service and the next service you're going to be sitting in the kids room and you're serving in kids ministry or, or you're helping in hospitality or you're serving in, in our tech ministry. You're, you're helping to welcome brand new people into this spiritual community. Can I tell you something? If it weren't for volunteers in this place, we could not do what we do. But yet there are some, you've come from another church where you poured out your life, you served, you died to self, and in the process, you got absolutely destroyed. You're taken advantage of. You, uh, you experienced a very real reality in American church culture of church hurt. And you need a place to heal. And yes, Mountain View is that place, and we will continue to be that place, this, this home for the wanderer, this place to find rest for the weary. But let's not forget a key part of this equation for the restoration of all things. And for the restoration of all things to happen, it takes work and it takes finances. Now, I'm not discounting the very real and very present church hurt. Listen, that's part of my story. If you would have asked me a year and a half ago if I ever wanted to pastor again, I would have told you no, likely other words involved. But there was a moment about a year and a half ago that I didn't think I'd ever pastor again. I didn't have any interest in being in church ministry ever again because of very real church hurt and very real church trauma. And so hear me loud and clear that this is a safe place to find healing and to get healthy. But let's not get stuck in that search for healing and health. Let's not get stuck in this rest for the weary and home for the wanderer. Let's get up and go, church. I'm a testament standing in front of you now that Jesus can do anything that Jesus can and will still use you after deep wounding and trauma at the hands of a local church. Carrie Newhoff goes on to say one of the most basic and hardest to live out tenets of being a Christ follower is to die to self. That's what baptism symbolizes. That's at the heart of Jesus' teaching. Die to yourself, live for others. Consumer culture Teaches the opposite. Live to myself, live for myself. Somehow, a lot of us still drink that Kool Aid. I'm increasingly convinced that, a church, that church shopping kills disciples. So pick a church, join that mission, stick with it, give yourself away, and in that you will find life. Stop asking what your church can do for you and start asking what you can do for your neighbors and your friends and for people far from Christ. Listen, there are big implications for me deciding not to be all about me and my own way and my own preferences and what I like and what I don't like. And what I'm inviting you to as a stakeholder of our church, what I'm asking is, do you have a stake in what God's doing here? If you were to ask the Spirit of God to confront your comfort in this moment, Jesus, would you, would you confront the areas of my life that I'm comfortable? What toes would Jesus step on? Maybe, maybe it's what Jesus said when he was talking about being obedient to all of Scripture. Maybe, maybe you've become a little bit selective in your obedience. Do you tend to relax certain things that Scripture says so that you can stay comfortable in life? And listen, I'm not just talking about serving. This is not a message on volunteering. This is a message on comfort. Maybe for you today, it's your heart. Maybe you're just somewhat devoted to Jesus. Maybe he's got the Sunday day of your life, 
and the rest of the six days, you do your own thing. Maybe for you, it's just a somewhat devotion. Maybe he has your spiritual life, but he doesn't have your stuff life. He doesn't have your financial life. How's your comfort being confronted today in light of the truth of God's word? Maybe for you, you've just designed a a life that doesn't require sacrifice. Maybe it's time for you to serve at this church rather than assuming someone else will do it. Maybe it's time for you to lead a small group. Did you know that there are people in our church actively looking for community, saying, I want to be a part of a small group, but we have nowhere to send them because we don't have a group that fits their schedule or their demographic. Maybe today is your day to say, you know what, I can, I can lead a small group. I can help out with that. Maybe it's time for you to, to put a stake in the ground and say, I want to be a stakeholder. This is my church home. I'm ready to unpack. Let's hang some pictures on the wall. I want to become a stakeholder. Maybe for you, it's time to begin to give sacrificially, to see God show up in ways financially that you've never imagined. Maybe for you, you already give, but you give financially and you don't give in serving and maybe Today's your day to start giving your time, not just your money, since spending money is often a whole lot more comfortable than spending time. Maybe for you today, it's the day that you say, you know what, we're going to get marriage counseling. We're going to stop living like roommates, and you start to invest in your marriage in that way. Maybe, Maybe you go to marriage counseling. Maybe for you today, it's time to forgive. That when Jesus invites us to forgive, just like we've been forgiven, maybe today's the day you take him at his word. Maybe for you, it's time to go to therapy on your own. Maybe, maybe you just send the email to me, uh, Brandon, could you send me that list of people that you recommend for a Christian therapist? Maybe today is time for you to take that first step in foster care. Rather than hoping we don't bring it up one more time. Maybe today you need to ask God to restore the joy of his salvation in your life. That joy, that fire, that passion that you've lost. So that we can begin to bend our heart toward gratitude. I would just ask today, before you leave, before you go and do whatever is next on your schedule, would you do business with Jesus? Would you... Ask the spirit of God that's inside you with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Spirit, would you answer this question in my life? Where do you want to confront my comfort? Let's pray. Jesus, we, we know we're asking a dangerous question. But today, would you confront the areas of our own life that were comfortable? Would you begin to reveal to us those areas that take no sacrifice for us to follow you? God, would you, in your kindness and in your grace and in your mercy, would you begin to reveal to us the areas that we're relaxing what you're inviting us to? that we're picking and choosing where we want to follow you and where we want to just leave you behind. God, would you confront our comfort in this moment? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.